to Trinity Platteville Church, Episcopal Church, and our worship this morning. Welcome to those of you who are online as well. It's good to have you here. We have a few announcements, and in making them, we have a couple of, at least one addition and one change. So let's look them over together. As you can see, the vestry did indeed meet. Uh, yesterday, had a big meeting. Someone else can fill you in on the details, maybe at the annual meeting. Um, so there's a, a soup and bread supper on the 7th, followed by the Tuesday service. And then you see the next mass coming up with Father Christian on the 11th. But before we get to Wednesday, the 14th, um, we are going to have a pancake supper here, um, Shrove Tuesday, from 5 to 7, 5 to 7 on the Tuesday before Ash Wednesday, and the Ash Wednesday service has a time now of 10 a.m. So are there other announcements? Yeah. On Ash Wednesday, I believe Father Christian's going to do Ashes to Go on campus uh, right around noon. So look for him somewhere on campus. Upper doors of the student center. Usually he, in the past, I know, uh, he's always, uh, Ash Wednesday has always fallen on a very bitterly cold day. So, <laughs> so maybe this one will, uh, will, will help him out a little bit. So, other announcements. Thanks for being here. Let us worship God together. now on page 355 in the Book of Common Prayer as our service continues, but also be aware that we shortly will be singing from the service section of the hymnal, Yes to Waiting. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ. 
Christ our Lord. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the lessons. The first lesson is from the 40th chapter of Isaiah. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits upon the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows upon them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your high eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youth will faint and be weary, 
and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The word of the Lord. We will read Psalm 147 together, all verses. And when we get to the last verse, 21, I want to hear it loud. <laughs> Hallelujah. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant it is to honor him with praise. The Lord rebuilds Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He counts the number of the stars and calls them all by their names. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. There is no limit to his wisdom. The Lord lifts up the lowly, but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music to our God upon the harp. He covers the heavens with clouds and prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass to grow upon the mountains and green plants to serve mankind. He provides food for flocks and herds and for the young ravens when they cry. He is not impressed by the might of a horse. He has no pleasure in the strength of a man. But the Lord has pleasure in those who fear him, in those whose wait his gracious faith. Hallelujah. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me. And woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this that in my proclamation, I may make the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share it, in its blessings. The word of the Lord.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus and his disciples left the synagogue at Capernaum and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her and she began to serve him. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases, cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, once again, good morning. If this sermon had a title, and it doesn't, uh, I think I would give it the title, Vulnerability. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick and possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place and there he prayed and Simon and his companions hunted for him. I've been thinking of this gospel lesson with its good news of Jesus wading into human misery and reaching out I've been thinking of Jesus facing crowds, indeed confronting, as Mark says here, the whole city gathered around the door. And I've been thinking about the importance of vulnerability. What kind of energy as a human being does Jesus expend here? We understand Jesus to be fully human. What kind of energy does it take to exercise mastery over demons? However, we understand the forces operating upon the human spirit and personality when we use that term, what kind of energy? What kind of personal cost? And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out demons. To be a healer is to bring salvation or to be a savior is to be a healer. 
The Greek root of the term salvation is rescue. But even that obscures, at least in part, the extensive meaning of the term. The scholar John Alsop has written about what it means to be saved or rescued, writes, the goal of such deliverance is the establishment of God's reign among his people. And then we know that many terms are associated with salvation, but essentially it means deliverance, deliverance from bondage. We prayed about that with our colic this morning, deliverance. This morning we did pray, set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins and give us the liberty of that abundant life in which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Salvation leads to liberty and an abundant life. In the Old Testament, though, the Hebrew adds another meaning. The root here is broadening or enlarging. Salvation enlarges. It creates space, in the, as also said, in the community for life and conduct. Salvation creates space. So from this perspective, more than individuals are being healed. Communities get affected. Communities get opened up and restored. That's why the whole city comes to the door. An energy is being released and the community gathers Liberation and salvation are linked. Now, our Old Testament lesson for this day, I think when you read it, does touch base with this idea of liberation. I can't do it the way Mary Lee did it, but have you not known, <laughs> have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. There's this mystery, but also this sense that God is present to, to liberate us. Listen. And later, he gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. And that beautiful ending, they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Strength is being renewed. Liberation, salvation, the dimensions of salvation are being announced to the whole community here in the midst of bondage. But this is also what Jesus is about. Also writes, the meaning of the term gospel, good tidings, is the essence of salvation. The traditions of Jesus record various accounts of Jesus' acts of delivering people from forms of physical, spiritual, psychic, demonic, cosmic bondage to a condition of restored wholeness and soundness. And he cites specifically this reading from Mark. Okay, all this takes energy. Jesus is bringing shalom, the Semitic term for peace, wholeness, and well-being. He's bringing that into the lives of people. We see him at work, but the question arises, where is his shalom? In the midst of healing, Jesus disappears. Is he fleeing? Is he drained? Well, perhaps. The disciples search, but he's nowhere to be found. I've been reading a book by Wayne Muller called Sabbath, and there's a chapter there that's called Dormancy. It's not too long. And he writes about both plant and animal communities retreating into a state of supreme inactivity. Dormancy, he says there are two stages. The first is quiescence. It's an initial stage and here, Plants especially slow their growth in response to environmental cues. I've got some plants in a cold room. They're slowing their growth. 
Quiescence is followed by rest. Muller points out that this stage is controlled more from within than without. Seedlings in the resting stage will not grow. And we know that various animals hibernate in winter. A woodchuck's body, he writes, temperature may drop more than 30 degrees Celsius. A mouse's heartbeat slows from 600 times per minute to 30 during hibernation. And then he starts connecting the dots, Muller does, to human spirituality and our need to rest. When we see Jesus withdraw from the press of the crowds and retreat to a place of rest, he's not simply taking a well-deserved break from his usual and exhausting ministry. He is honoring a deep spiritual need for a time dedicated not to accomplishment and growth, but to quiescence and rest. The disciples don't get it when they go hunting for him. There's work to be done. Where have you been? Often we don't get it as well. We don't understand that be, to be in the midst of healing, compassionate work, which we should be about, there is a profound need to rest. It's imperative. If Jesus asks us to follow him and figure out how we should wade into the midst of our community, follow him personally, we should also understand that this following includes rest, shalom, peace, wholeness, well-being. Personal shalom arrives in the midst of a willingness to keep some sort of Sabbath. But I said this was supposed to be about vulnerability. In our gospel from Mark, Jesus' habit of wading into human misery, suffering, anxiety, and confusion drains him. We know that. He seems to have discarded the usual human self-protective covering over his personality and over his very being. He becomes vulnerable. Excessively vulnerable. This may seem to be a stretch, but I don't think so. All this suggests to me that to be a healer is to become vulnerable in some way, shape, or form. Are we willing to take this step? Over the past weeks, I've arrived at a new awareness and appreciation of my own vulnerability. For me, Recently, strangely, it seems to be linked to joy, even liberation. But this connection has not always existed or even been apparent. After most of my medical interventions for cancer, a cancer which thankfully has been, at least for a while, eradicated, I moved from some minor annoyances associated with radiation therapy to the arrival of an occasional grip of anxiety, sometimes in the form of waves of panic. Now this is trifling in comparison to the suffering of others, but I have seen it when it appears as an affliction. Rarely have I seen it as an opportunity for the presence of the Spirit of God. In the midst of waves of anxiety and their aftermath, I have found myself strangely vulnerable, but strangely also joyous. How can this be? Filled with gratitude. I want to tell you that the presence of this Trinity Church family the presence of Mary Lee and our family, other friends, all of these personal connections have been wonderfully restorative. There is for me a new kind of joy, a new kind of liberation from bondage, from the bondage of anxiety that is still with me. I am wounded and I am healed at the same time. It seems to me that when we allow ourselves to become vulnerable, when we become maybe sensitive to the places in our own personal life where we are risking something of who we are, when we admit this, 
admit it to others, something happens. In spiritual terms, grace happens, a liberating grace. And so as we conclude, let me suggest that the demand of Jesus to follow him involves a willingness to become vulnerable. That's what he was. Both when Jesus engaged and when he fled human community, his life and ministry involved vulnerability. He was vulnerable as a healer, and he was vulnerable in prayer. Until that vulnerability brought him to the cross. When we sense our own vulnerability, perhaps we will more deeply appreciate how much our Savior discarded his own protective coverings and offered himself up as the ultimate healer, that is, the Savior of the cosmos. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Nicene Creed is found on page 358 of the Book of Common Prayer. Let us stand and say it together. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. Prayers of the People are Form 3, found on page 387. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church, that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. Ministers in your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake, that our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, that they may deliver from their distress. 
We pray for the special needs and concerns of this congregation and for others. We especially pray for Stacy, Dan, Teddy, Katrina, Steve, Faye, Jeremy, and Dennis. For the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for um, Archbishop Foley Beach and his wife, Allison, and Bishop Frank Lyons and his wife, Shawnee. And for the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for St. Onscars in Heartland. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May they also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things, heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people, and strengthen us to do your will, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now let us confess our sins to God and our neighbor using a confession on page 360. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you, God, word, and deed, by what you have done, by what you have done, and 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 by what you have done, Almighty God, have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins for our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness by the power of the Holy Spirit, and you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand. And now the peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us with gladness present the offerings and oblations of our life and labor to the Lord.
Your first prayer this morning is prayer A, found on page 261. <laughs> The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is Gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself, but then fallen into sin, and become subject to evil and death. You, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for your members. After supper, he took a cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. He said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for your members of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is Christ died. Christ is risen. Christ is celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O oh Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, for calling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. We sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to feed for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also. That we may faithfully receive this holy sacrifice. And serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. 
and bless them. Bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him, with the communion and unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Savior has taught us very bold to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day and every day of bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Passover is sacrificed for us.
post-communion prayer is found on page 365. Now 